ready to start the meeting. So welcome everyone and um, I extend that welcome to um, our residents who've also come along tonight. I'm just going to begin by um, saying that the council has a significant challenge in setting the budget for next year to fund over £27 million worth of pressures. We do not have enough funding to provide the same services next year as we are doing this year and therefore we have to look at what we're able to provide with the funding we have available. We are also under external scrutiny following the publication of two government reports which expect us in no uncertain terms to ensure we can present a balanced budget for next year and demonstrate that we're financially sustainable for the longer term. The proposals put before the committee this evening will be consulted upon Following the outcome of that, we will recommend a budget to full council at this committee on the 15th of February. If we fail to do this, we will receive government intervention, which will result in far worse action being taken across the borough, and this committee is not prepared for that to happen. Thank you. I'm just going to briefly speak about the webcast. So this meeting will be webcast a record retained on the council website for up to two years. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting for your name, the content of what you say, and your image to be broadcast and stored to the council website. If any member, officer or member of the public addressing the committee has concerns with this, please contact the committee services officer immediately. For those at home viewing the webcast, I would like to inform you that if you look above the video, you will see a resources tab Select this and a link to the agenda will appear in the right hand side. This will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow the discussion and debate. I'm going to move on to agenda item two, which is apologies and I haven't received any. Agenda item three is members' code of conduct. I'm just going to ask members to consider whether they have any disclosable pecuniary interests and, and or any other relevant interest in connection with any of the items on this agenda. If you do, can you declare them and state the nature of the interest, please? Okay, no one's declared any. Agenda item four is minutes, pages one to fourteen. I'm going to ask members to approve the accuracy of the minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of November and the 1st of December 2021. Have we agreed? Thank you. Do I have a seconder on that one? Thank you. Agenda item five is public and member questions. Public questions, we have 13. 13 have been received. Uh, the public questions part of the committee will be limited to 30 minutes, as written in the Council's constitution, and questioners have a maximum of two minutes to ask their question. So we're going to move on to question one. The first, um, the first batch of questions are going to be because people have come along tonight in person to ask them, so it's only right that they're given a chance to ask them in case we run out of time. So, Jonathan White, you've got a question for us, thank you. Um, how do you turn? So, so yeah, everybody hear me, yeah? Okay. Um, I'm a local resident, I live in Wallasey. Um, was brought and born, up, uh, born and brought up in, in Morton. Um, the council uh, has £114 million in reserves. The budget cap is £27 million. Well, it was reported the week before last, it was £27 million. We've heard it may be £20 million this week. There seems to have been some movement on that. What are the justifications for the council holding such a substantial reserve when local needs and we will demand expenditure to maintain services and jobs. It's okay, thank you firstly for that question. I'm actually quite pleased it's been asked tonight, especially publicly, because I think there's a lot of um, concern and noise around our reserves and it's given us the opportunity to respond to that, so thanks. So all of the reserves held are used towards the cost of services but none of these can be used to support the budget gap. All of the reserves that make up the total are earmarked or ring-fenced for specific one-off items that will need to be funded, which have previously been agreed 
either via cabinet or policy and services. Policy and services committee. At the Council Policy and Resources Committee on the 1st of December, a new five-year medium-term financial strategy was approved, which specified that no one-off reserves will be used to support the Council's budget due to the unsustainable nature of this funding. This is something that is advised by the Council's auditors, Grant Thornton, who have previously commented, we do not consider that this is a sustainable position and action is needed to set a budget that is not reliant on reserves and that the Council will need to put in place clear plans to reduce its future recurring service expenditure and move to a balanced revenue position that does not rely on its reserves. Having said that, members have asked uh, repeatedly and sought assurances that there's nothing in our earmarked reserves that could be used, that could be shaken out, and we have been given a fair no on that one. Is there any scope for um, 7.2 million of those reserves to be used so the second capitalisation loan is no longer needed? And I suppose linked to that would be, um, even though the budget gap would be around £80 million pounds or something like that, there's absolutely no chance of being able to use that in any form whatsoever. I'm going to let Chair answer that one, thanks. In terms of capitalisation, um, as, as the Chair said, we do hold reserves for specific purposes. Um, we do a six monthly review of all our reserves to make sure those reserves are held um, for those purposes and that they will be um, anticipated and planned to be spent in the future. We have done that. Um, at this point in time, we haven't identified any that could go towards to pay off the capitalisation directive. Um, if, if we'd have done that, well, we, we did that earlier on before we actually applied for the capitalisation directive. Um, and at that time, obviously, if there were any that could have been released then, we wouldn't have applied for the full amount of the capitalisation directive. Um, so at this, at this point in time, they are under constant review, as I say, um, but at this point in time, we can't use any to offset that. In terms of, um, I think, the follow-up question about using the reserves for the budget, um, as, as the Chair sort of uh, provided in her first response, it is unsustainable, we're not able to use one-off funding to uh, balance a permanent budget. Um, and we have been um, under uh, quite a bit of criticism from our external auditors about doing this. And we have seen in other councils where external audit have issued a public interest report because they have warned councils for doing this um, in previous years and they've not adhered to it. So uh, to mitigate the risk of that and to make sure that we don't come under any further scrutiny, we wouldn't be using money to balance the budget. Thank you. Question two is from David Bird. So is David here? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for this opportunity to address you. Uh, can I thank also Queen Griffiths for his efforts, although unsuccessful, to link up the, this room's loop system with your, with your system. Um, so I'm going to have difficulty participating in this meeting. Uh, my name is David Byrne, I'm age 79, and obviously I have a hearing disability. I'm well known for my community involvement in the Bromborough and Eastern areas. So my question directed to you, Chair of this committee, has the Council of Andon any attempt to mirror the Preston model of community wealth building? I ask because in the introduction to the pension, to the budget saving proposals presented to this meeting, there is no mention of community wealth building. Actually, the word community doesn't appear, nor does the word wealth, nor does the word building. They're all missing either individually or collectively. The proposals refer to remodelling. Whatever people here might think about that choice of words, it does not amount to a vision. Most rural residents, certainly those I've spoken to, think that the cuts are more of the 
failed approach undertaken year after year after year in the past decade. Yet, in the pioneering near neighbour Preston, community wealth building has proved remarkably successful over a 12 year period. The document before us doesn't even make a passing reference to what seemed not so many years ago to have some, an idea that had some traction within political circles in the will, uh, including yourself, Madam Chair. Uh, so my little supplementary question, where is the positive, inspiring, will vision? It doesn't seem to be here. Well, thank you for the question. And um, obviously, as you've said, something that's really close to my heart. And I can give you an assurance that community wealth building has not been abandoned on Wirral. In fact, our strategy was embedded um, in 2020 when we launched it through Cabinet. And then it went through policy and resources last year and got cross-party support. Um, I've worked very closely with Preston and with CLESS on ensuring that our community wealth building strategy is here, it's here to stay, it will grow, and it's embedded in everything that we do. Probably because we launched the strategy nearly two years ago, it, it, it might have appeared to residents that it's fallen off the radar, but I can assure you it really hasn't. And I, I can give a commitment that we will continue as a community wealth building council to make sure that it is there and it does underpin everything we do. Um, with regards to the community bank not being able to go ahead just yet, I have expressed my disappointment in that, as that was pivotal to our community wealth building strategy, but it certainly will not stop us from going from strength to strength with community wealth building, and I hope that answers your question. document. You go into the public uh, with something that they regard as cut after cut after cut, no change from the past. Uh, then I can't find a supporter for it. But there's, there's no reason. Why, why have you written a document which doesn't include community wealth building? I'm going to bring Sharon now because I, I didn't write the document. Sorry, I can barely see your name and I don't know who you are or what, what your position is. I'm the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Cher Halewood. I'm the Director of Resources and also the Section 151 Officer for the Council. Um, it's my responsibility to make sure the budget is legal and can be deliverable um, next year in all the decisions that the Policy and Resources Committee make. Um, so you're not a counsellor? No, a... I'm not, no, I'm an officer. All right, so I think it is, it's a Q&A session, so I think with all respect we've got how much left, how much longer left on this 20 minutes and another, another 11 questions to get through. So, I mean, you're more than welcome to write to us with any supplementaries and I'll make sure you get as much information as we can provide. But I think in the interest thank, of fairness... Thank, thank you for listening to me anyway. Okay, thank you. So question three, we've got William Phillips, and this is one for uh, Liz Gray. <laughs> Sorry, as said, my name is William Phillips. I'm an Oxford resident and one of the lead coordinators for Liverpool City Co Coalition. I was left deeply confused by the council proposed cuts to the climate emergency actions for a period of one year, especially given to my knowledge that the Wirral Council declared a climate emergency in 2019. My question was, if this proposal were to pass, how does the Wirral Council plan to deal with the fact that the climate emergency will not take a year break, and the issues that these actions were planned to combat will simply have grown and become more expensive? Um, the 
proposal we have been given to suspend the Climate Emergency Fund has, like the other pro proposals, not been decided yet, and all the proposals will be voted on at Budget Council on the 28th of February. But I can assure you that we will be prioritising all aspects in the Wirral Plan 2026, and obviously the climate emergency is a fundamental part of this. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Thanks, Will. So next we've got um, Claire Hetherington. Is Claire here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. And that's for Yvonne, Councillor Yvonne Nolan. Thank you, Councillor Nolan. Um, I'm here to ask the Council Right, so my question relates to the budget proposals for adult care and health. And I'd basically like to know what's meant by the following obscure terms that many ordinary people, like me, and even a few councillors may not understand. Demand mitigation, increased efficiency requirements, a range of case reviews, demand management approaches, care provider market shaping. And that practically is the whole uh, text of the policy for adult um, care, social care. And uh, I'd like to know what that all means for the next translation to plain English and an explanation of how this will achieve the estimated 3.89 million saving. Demand mitigation yeah, is one of those, those horrible um, corporate speak terms. Um, it's about how we manage um, the demands that are on the service. The number of people who come through the door and how we best provide um, services to them. We know, um, for example, that as, as we've moved on, in social care and as we've developed new approaches, we can actually deal with things in a much, much better way. So we would do something like now, we, we're building and we have in plans to build a further 500 and odd um, extra care housing, where we would move people into extra care housing when they require additional support, rather than previously, um, where we would have been looking at residential care which is not ideal for them and, and certainly not, not, um, not for us. And it's also, we are changing, um, we've already piloted in two areas and are now rolling out um, the way we um, approach people at the front door. Over the last few years, unfortunately, um, there's been a sort of care management approach where it's been services first. First thing that social workers are asked to look at as services, whereas in fact, very often there are other ways in which people can be supported um, and they may well be able to be linked into activities in their local communities um, and supported in, those, in other ways than necessarily wanting to be dependent. Most people don't want to be dependent on services if there's any other way we can support them. So that's what we mean by demand mitigation. What it doesn't mean, and I think there is um, a concern that when you talk about mitigation, any demand mitigation, Anyway, you're talking about rationing, and I absolutely assure you we're not doing that in any way, shape, or form. Um, increased efficiency requirement that's about mm. continuously, I think, um, all of us are having to look at how we deal more effectively with services. So, for example, again, it's about ongoing developments. We've had a lot of developments, a lot of advances in assistive technology, and the way we can use that to enable people to remain in their own homes and to remain independent um, rather than, again, having to um, come into residential care or having to have carers going into them. Very often we can support them with um, assistive technology. So things like that are more efficient um, to do. And yes, okay, that, that also means that we will save on, on budget, which has got to be a good thing. A range of case reviews. Everyone gets a case review. Every year, everyone is such a terror we have to review everyone who, for whom we provide services. 
annually. Because what happens is very often when people are first provided services, it's at a time of crisis, or it's at a time when they're in a lot of need, perhaps they've just been discharged from hospital. Um, and, and it's very easy to let those provisions run on. So we need to review to say, is this still the right provision for you? Is this the best way of doing things? Do you need this level of care? Is this what you still want? Or is there some other way in which we can support you? Um, some people we would need to have that support increased, and some people would need that support decreased, or get additional support from things like assistive technology. So that's the thing about, about case reviews. Um, demand management is the same thing as, as demand mitigation. Mm. And care provider market shaping, that's, that's something that was statutorily required to do under the Care Act, um, to shape the market. And effectively, what that means really is make sure we've got enough provision out there because, as you know, we are required to put um, care provision out into the private sector. Um, and sector to tender for all types of care provision, whether that's domiciliary care or if it's residential. Um, and it's our job to ensure that we have the right uh, number of providers out there to provide the right level of service. Um, for example, at the minute there are really significant difficulties within the domiciliary care market because of people isolating, people being not sick with COVID. So knock-on effect there of having delays and getting care for people um, and people being um, unable to, to leave hospital because they're having to wait um, for, for care to be provided. So, I mean, okay, that's a temporary thing, obviously, because of, of COVID. But if that were to be a permanent thing, then that would mean our commissioners were not effectively shaping the market because we didn't have sufficient care providers out there in the market to meet the demand. So it's our job to make sure that we have a market that meets the demand. What I can assure you is that there are no, there will be no, um, we're not cutting services directly. We're not going, we're going to close this, and we're going to close that, or that will shut down, or that will be reduced. It's not, that's not the way it will work. It will be about working more effectively and more efficiently right across the piece. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, it's not quite clear how we can save 3.8 million million. Sorry to intervene, but we've still got quite a lot of questions to go and we're kind of running short on time. Thank you. If I can just tell you if it helps, over the last three, four years we've been saving four million pounds a year every year by using this approach. So it's more of the same. Thank you. Hi. Question five, we have Nicola Chambers. I'm not sure if she could make it actually, so I don't think she's here. In that case, we can have the response, uh, the question read out to the, to the councillor Nolan again. So Phil, if you read the question. Certainly, Chair. Uh, question is, in assessing and identifying services and asset removal and reduction, has the Wirral Health Inequality Plan data been incorporated to allow for consistent, transparent and equality of impact so that identified cuts do not disproportionately affect disadvantaged groups, for example based on age, disability, race, and also adversely affect local communities already identified as deprived with greater incidence of childhood obesity and societal pressures known to contribute to com compromised mental health and well-being, unemployment and therefore financial access to services, poor housing, crime and antisocial behaviour, illness and substance dependency. Thank you. Yeah. Um, at this point, these are proposals. Um, if we as we go into consultation, This, at the next meeting of policy and resources, this committee recommends um, the budget to council. At that point, there will be 
um, equality impact assessments will be conducted. What I can say is that the question assumes asset removal, um, services and asset removal, and I've just explained that's not the way in which um, we, we will be looking to manage the necessary cuts, unfortunately, that have to be made in the adult budget. Thank you. So my full time, I'm going to go on to question five, which is one for Councillor Cameron. Um, this is uh, going to be read out by Phil because the person's not here. And I think after this, we might have to just, um, it, I think it's only fair that people who've turned up here, there are other questions we've been asked, but we won't have time to get the responses in. So we'll make the written responses available on the internet. But, but we're going to, we're going to do this one. Now, I just have a suggestion to save time. I'm not sure if Mel Gilfoyle is the um, welfare officer that works with Unison, but I'm happy to write to her with a full response because the library strategy is coming to committee tomorrow. It might save some time, or I can read a response out. Do you want to get on to people who are here? Well, no, we, we've, everyone who's turned, turned up to ask a question has done that, which is why I'm leaving that to the people that aren't here. Thanks, just, though. Just trying to save time, thanks. Okay, so you're going to read that one out, Phil. Now the question is, uh, I would be grateful if you could inform me as to what consideration has been given to the impact of closing local libraries will have for families where children do not have a designated room for their studies. This generally will affect children in more deprived areas of the borough, where academic achievement is already below the national average, where children often have to share bedrooms and finding space and quiet to do their homework can be difficult. Libraries currently provide a suitable environment for older children to study, use the internet and get support from staff. It also offers many, to many younger children stimulation and support around speech and literacy. If you remove these services, are you going to provide additional support for these children in order to provide, avoid negatively impacting on their academic achievement and chance to thrive in adulthood? Thank you. And, uh, thanks for the question. A key priority in the library strategy for the next five years is to support reading attainment in areas of need. So this point is extremely valid and as the progress and success of the service will be measured by this indicator and other key indicators. Recent data indicates that the current baseline usage for age groups 13 to 17 and 18 to 24 year olds represents 3.24% of current users. Whilst this does not indicate a high level of need amongst this demographic, the new model and library strategy is dedicated to ensuring we increase engagement and provide a service based on current and future need. Whilst there are 11 physical sites that are being considered as part of the proposed model, we have ensured that geographic coverage and accessibility of libraries remains for all that wish to use them. The sites identified within the preferred option three of a report which will be coming tomorrow evening to the Tourism, Communities, Culture and Leisure Committee the libraries are well situated and located to provide sufficient geographic coverage across Wirral whilst taking into account consideration areas of greatest need and for those impacted by multiple barriers of access like car ownership and low income. The sites are also predominantly situated in areas with high density of active borrowers. We've used a mapping tool to ensure that secondary and further education establishments are still within the acceptable distance to a physical library site to support access from potential users in this demographic. Closer working links with the school's library service will also be developed as this service is vital in ensuring that literacy requirements of children are supported and where possible attainment gaps are addressed. Finally, we want to emphasise that we'll be use, we will use the forthcoming consultation, if agreed, to identify need across this age group and how we as a library service can better serve and engage with potential users. Where any impact is identified, we will ensure that sufficient and effective mitigation is developed. Okay, thank you. As far as I'm aware, all of the other questions I've got here in front of me uh, are, so we have got, okay, so, would you like, I'm sorry about that, I, should, I didn't realise that we had someone else in person, so, sorry, and your question was to who? Uh, it was to the chair. To me. Um, I'm a local resident as well. Um, 
So our town halls have been identified by the council as strategic assets within the world's one billion regeneration plan. However, decades of poor maintenance and lack of vision mean these buildings do not meet the needs or challenges of a future regenerated world. Their poor management has resulted in low use, pitiful income and a disconnect with the public. On both town halls, the council have been led blindly to throw good money after bad, an 800k staircase at Wallasey being just one example. These completely miss an, a wider number of users and partners the council could work with to see these community buildings as catalysts to regenerating their local areas and become self-sustaining assets as seen with many halls and institutions across the country. Let's be honest, any fire sale on our town halls will be down to poor management. Public officials and council paid consultants will have you believe that these and many of the assets discussed here tonight are of low use, low consequence and a liability to the balance sheet. Committee, now is the time for these buildings to be seen as strategic, community owned, community run, community enablers and not dispose now, think later assets. Will the council ensure that this mismanagement ends? These buildings are properly consulted on with the community groups. Will the council seek viable community focused alternatives? that fulfil the potential use of these assets and ensure their sustainable future. And finally, will the council stop praising community wealth building and actually put money where their mouth is and take these assets seriously? Councillor Tony Jones, you're going to respond to that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for the question, Liam. There are no current proposals to release Birkenhead or Wallasey Town Hall as part of a fire sale. Birkenhead Town Hall has seen significant investment over years in line with its heritage status and is currently being used for a number of council services as well as being a venue for weddings and other social occasions, COVID permitting. Whilst detailed work has not yet been undertaken, the Town Hall is likely to play an important heritage role within the extent of regeneration programmes and projects underway in Birkenhead. Wallasey Town Hall falls within the Seacon Corridor and work is currently being undertaken to realise the opportunities of this asset within a wider regeneration framework and ambition for the area. There is a strong focus on community use but with elements of potential commercial income generation. Thanks for the question, Lynn. Okay, so we've actually exceeded the 30 minutes, but I think in fairness that we should cover the questions that we're not going to, we haven't got time for, but we will read them out to people that hear so they can hear what we've been asked. And if they want or they're interested in the response, they can go online and see it. So we've got up to question seven, eight. So could we go through the remainder now? Thank you. So we have question eight was, was as a question from Carl Davis, and that would be for Councillor Lewis Bray. Can you just read it out for our residents, please? Certainly, Chair. <coughs> uh, can I ask how, in the light of the fantastic work done by the Parks and Countryside Department, especially during specifically the COVID-19 pandemic, the upkeep and maintenance of the parks and countryside for us to walk and have a daily exercise and have some fresh air in a safe environment. How can you cut the budgets and stop maintenance in up to 20 parks? So as I say, the response will go on our website. We're up to question nine now, and that would have been another one for Councillor Gray, and this is from Anne Litherland. I am a member of the Call Will Partnership, working with my, my parish of Holy Apostles and Martyrs Policy and Faiths for Change in a Women Wide Faith Group. We are working to reduce our carbon footprint and engage our communities to do the same. We will council have been the leader within the country by engaging faith communities in this urgent task. I want to ask how the council can postpone initiatives like this in the face of the real climate emergency. We have a moral duty to act as faith groups, but also to urge you to act on behalf of the poorest in our communities, both here in Wirral and overseas, who are suffering now and will suffer more in the future. The climate will not wait for a year, the changes here and now and getting worse every day. Leaving it a year will exacerbate the problem, relying on outside finance will not be achievable in the year, especially with the new lead officer in post finding their feet. 
Okay, thank you. Go on to question 10, and that is for Councillor Yvonne Nolan from Phil Simpson. I strongly object to the proposals to cut what amounts to 3.6 million to the adult health and social care budgets. These cuts are focusing on targeting the most vulnerable people in our society yet again. Therefore, I wish to submit the following question to committee. The proposal for budget savings in adult health and social care could see a saving of 3.6 million. I assume there will be a saving on administration costs, but the majority of it will be incurred by service users, the most vulnerable people within our society. Can you please provide more transparency uh, and detail to show where 3.6 million of savings is to come from? Thanks, Bill. On to question 11 is for me. So it's from Dr. Rona O'Brien. Uh, in the absence of economic risk assessments and equality impact assessments, in addition to proposed increase in council tax, it would appear that budget proposals for 22 23 are expecting well residents sorry, well residents, to pay more for less. Can this committee justify why council salaries and severance payments have almost doubled in the period 2016 to 2021, whilst cuts to public spending are being proposed? Thanks, Phil. Uh, question 12 is for Councillor Helen Cameron, and it's from Ian Seddon. The proposed closure of the Europa Fund pool has been laid out in documents in terms of cost savings. What sort of review took place to consider the health benefits of children using this pool, particularly during school holidays and the fact that many families cannot afford to go away on holidays, making this pool an important place for children to be able to go? Was consideration given to the detrimental effect this will have on children's well-being, which surely overrides any cost considerations? Thank you, and our final question is for Councillor Tony Jones, and it's from Susan, Susan Kirkham. Will the green space at Upton Roundabout be protected from being sold to become a car park? This area not only absorbs some of the pollution, but it also allows people to walk slightly further away from the busy road and avoid the worst of the noxious fumes. It is beneficial for physical and human health to be in and near green space. Selling it off will therefore have a double negative impact on people's health. Okay, so thank you. As I say, the questions that were unanswered tonight because we ran out of time, well, all of the questions and answers will be put on our website. And can I ask that that gets done as soon as possible? Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. And thank you for everyone that's turned up to ask their questions too. Next agenda item is public and member questions. Uh, we've, done the, we've done the questions. We move on to statements and petitions. Do we have any petitions? Councillor Jean Robinson, thanks. Thank you, Chair. I've got a petition here um, on my petition signed by 3,193 <coughs> people against the proposal of the permanent closure and dem dem demolition of Woodchurch Leisure Centre and Swimming Pool. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I haven't been notified of any other petitions. Okay. Then we on to the next item. Questions by members. I'm being notified of any. Okay. So we're going to go on to agenda item six, which is our budget and performance management. It's a 2022-23 budget update, and I'm going to invite the Chief Executive Paul Sator to introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, before I bring the Chair in uh, to present the report, um, the number of comments and observations I want to make in support of this statement made by the, the Leader of the Council at the, the start of this meeting. As, as you know, last year we were, our council was one of a small number of local authorities to request exceptional financial support during the COVID-19 pandemic. <coughs> DLUC and MSCLG previously agreed to balance the budget for 2020-2021 and for 2021-2022, subject to two external reviews. The exceptional financial support in the shape of a loan uh, <coughs> It was secured for last year. This year's capitalisation is not yet finally secured. Both, both reports were critical of Wilbur Council. Uh, the two reports were around leadership and governance and around finance. The reviews indicated that over the years, the authority has tried to continue to deliver the same level, level of services despite not having the financial means to do so. We've resorted in the past to short-term measures 
one-off grants and reserves. The two reports have set out a number of key recommendations <coughs> aimed to put us on a sound financial footing for the future, which the support of the independent panel will ensure that we have a comprehensive financial recovery plan and that independent panel will monitor that plan for a delivery. Failure to do so will lead to further steps being taken by government. Since the publication of the report, I'm pleased to say that officers have worked to prepare the proposal that is before you today. Since November, members and officers have worked, have met weekly as a finance subgroup, and they have been very engaged and constructive meetings. There have been very difficult and challenging discussions between members and officers and these meetings remain ongoing. The financial position for 2022-2023 has been established. We've established budget envelopes, the budget envelopes that are needed for each directorate. The council has recognised it can't continue as it has and is facing up to the challenge of putting in, putting in place a sound financial footing. Thank you. I'll pass over to share. this report, I just wanted to, to mention that Stuart Fair, who uh, the committee know is working with us as um, interim finance director, was due to be here to present this report this evening, unfortunately due to unforeseen circumstances, he sends his apologies, so um, I will present the report myself this evening. So as the chair mentioned, this is um, an update on the budget so far, it's a suite of, uh, a number of suite of reports that have been coming to the committee um, over the past 12 months really uh, in relation to the budget setting process for um, next year. And it's the first report that's actually come to the committee following the draft local government funding settlement, um, which we received at the end of, or the middle of December. Um, along with some uh, items to note in terms of the recommendations in the report, the main recommendation is for the committee to consult on the draft budget uh, for 22-23. And as part of that budget, there are uh, several proposals out for consultation, which you will see in Appendix 3 um, in the pack. So, um, as I mentioned, this is the first report since we've received the Local Government Funding Settlement. It is a draft funding settlement and it is out for comment uh, and consultation, or it was. The consultation is now closed um, and the, uh, we expect the final funding settlement sometime this month. It may change and we won't know until we've actually received that funding settlement. Um, the recommendation I just referred to within the report in relation to the consultation for proposals um, the list of proposals are included in the appendix and there's been quite a, a long process that has actually been undertaken um, in relation to getting to these um, proposals, including uh, to ensure that they are robust and that they are um, as accurate as they can be with the information that we have available at the moment. And the proposals have undergone, in terms of the uh, templates that have been completed, uh, some uh, external scrutiny by um, SIPFA, which is the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, and they have reviewed every one of the proposals to ensure that the information we've put forward is uh, legal and will be deliverable um, either in full or in part in uh, next year's budget 22-23. Um, just in terms of the appendices for the report, so um, I just wanted to mention Appendix 1. Um, actually shows the movement on the funding that we have received following the draft financial uh, settlement from the government and it does show individually uh, the funding that we had anticipated and the changes in that funding for next year. Some of that funding is ring-fenced and specifically to uh, social care, in particular adult social care and children's social care can only be used for that purpose. Uh, the appendix one also shows uh, the movement in, uh, in other items as well.